All right. Uh, I want to apologize for being late because I've decided I'm like the queen. Whenever I arrive, is on time. Okay. Quoi? Il va pleuvoir. Oui, c'est ça. L'état, c'est moi. Um, okay. Uh, in a short while, I will be joined by uh, my colleague Ramesh Rajasingham, who is the acting Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, uh, and he's here to brief you on his recent visit to Burkina Faso. A uh, couple of updates, country updates for you. On Myanmar, the UN resident uh, humanitarian coordinator and resident coordinator, uh, Ola Almgren, tweeted out that yesterday was a tragic day for Myanmar and stressed it is not acceptable that dozens of unarmed and peaceful protesters were killed and many more injured. Mr. Almgren stressed that the perpetrators must be held to account. For its part, the UN Children's Fund said today that as of yesterday, at least five children and multiple young, pe young people and adults were reportedly being killed. At least four children have been severely wounded. More than 500 children have been arrested arbitrarily, according to UN Children's Fund. UNICEF, of course, condemns in the strongest possible terms the use of force against children, including the use of live ammunition and the arbitrary detention of children, and calls on security forces to immediately refrain from violence and to keep children and young people out of harm's way. Also on Myanmar, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, today called on the country's military to stop murdering and jailing protesters after another day of deadly violence across the country. This is the moment to turn the tables towards justice and the end of the military stranglehold over democracy, Ms. Bachelet said. Update for you on the representation of Myanmar here at the United Nations. So in addition to the communications which we have received in the past few days concerning the permanent representative of Myanmar, we have also received a communication yesterday from the permanent mission of Myanmar informing us that, uh, excuse me, uh, informing us that the deputy permanent representative of Myanmar, Mr. Tin Maung Nyang, has submitted his letter of resignation to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Myanmar and recalling that Mr. Kyo Mo Tun remains the permanent representative of Myanmar to the United Nations. Upon request by the chair of the Credentials Committee, uh, this communication has been circulated to members of the committee. Uh, turning to Yemen, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that significant displacement is being reported in Marib Governorate, especially in Sirwa District, as fighting continues along several front lines in recent days. More than 14,000 people have been displaced so far. Aid agencies are warning that many as 385,000 men, women and children could be forced to flee as a result of this offensive. Many of them have had to go to crowded displacement sites where services are overly stretched. We, along with our partners, are continuing to respond and have reached more than 11,000 people with food baskets, emergency shelter kits, and other forms of urgent life-saving assistance. Also on Yemen, I can tell you that we are deeply concerned by the recent reports of increased Houthi cross-border attacks against Saudi Arabia. We know with further concern wider escalatory actions by all parties to the conflict in Yemen, including airstrikes, as well as continued military offensive by the Houthis in Marib, as we've just talked about. These actions undermine prospect for peace and regional stability and are detrimental to the ongoing diplomatic efforts to end the conflict. We call on the parties to refrain from further fanning the flames of conflict and remain committed to advancing the political process to reach a comprehensive negotiated settlement. We are deeply concerned by the recent reports of Houthi cross-border attacks against Saudi Arabia, and we know with further concern the wider, um, I'm sorry, uh, strike what I've just said. Um, we also have an update for you on the Safar oil tanker. Uh, we continue to discuss several pending logistical issues uh, for the mission with the Houthis, also known as Ansar Allah. As you heard a few weeks ago from Mark Lokok, these issues are a major reason why we've had to delay the planned deployment that was supposed to happen this month. The discussions, however, have been proceeding. 
We recently got permits for mission personnel, travel permits for mission personnel, but so far we don't have any concrete solutions for some of the other pending issues. Until those other issues are resolved, we don't, we are not in a position to spend more donor money to rent a vessel or estimate a new timeline for the mission. Turning to Ethiopia, Mark Lokok, the emergency relief coordinator, um, briefed the Security Council uh, today. Um, and I just want to say, he, uh, excuse me, uh, that access to um, more, he says that more actions are needed to scale up humanitarian deliveries. Mr. Lokok pointed out that at least 4.5 million people in Tigray need assistance, according to official estimates. Many people in rural areas remain inaccessible, and food security is a major concern. Access to water, hygiene, sanitation services are largely disrupted across Tigray, incre uh, increasing the risk of a disease outbreaks, including waterborne diseases, measles, and COVID-19. Health officials are also disrupted. Uh, excuse me. Health services are also disrupted, with only 22 percent of the 205 health facilities in Tigray being fully functional. Mr. Lokok says that despite recent progress, much more needs to be done to get aid to people who need it through, uh, throughout Tigray. He emphasized the need to dramatically scale up humanitarian assistance throughout the province by facilitating independent needs assessment, deploying humanitarian staff throughout the province, restoring of basic communications and banking services, and also called for increased and urgent funding for humanitarian operations. Also in Ethiopia, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, stressed the urgent need for an objective, independent assessment of the facts on the ground in Tigray. She said she continues to receive deeply distressing reports of sexual gender-based violence, extrajudicial killings, widespread destruction, and looting of public and private property uh, by all parties. She stressed that there's also reports of continuing fighting in central Tigray. The High Commissioner noted that a preliminary analysis of the information received indicates that serious violations of international law, possibly amounting to war crimes and crimes against humanity, may have been committed by multiple actors in the conflict. These include the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, Eritrean Armed Forces, and the Amhara Regional Forces and affiliated militias. And a tragic uh, note that we've received from our colleagues at the International Organization of Migration. They say that at least 20 people have drowned off the coast of Djibouti after smugglers threw dozens of migrants, fellow human beings, overboard. This happened yesterday, and this is a third such incident in the Gulf of Aden in the past six months. These migrants were just trying to reach Yemen. Survivors receiving, are receiving medical treatment at an IOM center in Djibouti, and they tell us that over at least 200 other migrants, including children, were crowded aboard the vessel. 30 minutes into the journey, the smugglers forced 80 of them to go overboard and threw them into the sea. COVID-19 mobility restrictions have drastically reduced travel on this uh, route. Um, however, IOM is concerned that as restrictions ease, more migrants will attempt the dangerous journey, raising the prospect of future tragedies. IOM and, of course, all of us are calling for the prosecution of crimes committed by smugglers and human traffickers, uh, as well as new migration pathways to allow people to pursue work uh, opportunities abroad in a safe, legal, and dignified manner. Uh, our colleague Atul Kare, the head of the Department of Operational Support, is in Sudan this week. In Khartoum, he had discussions with government officials, mainly focusing on the drawdown and liquidation of the UN joint mission in Darfur, underscoring that in line with relevant Security Council resolutions, the drawdown period would be completed by the end of June this year. Liquidation will take an additional 12 to 18 months. He sought the support of Sudanese officials to ensure an orderly and safe withdrawal of the mission, including for the handover of team sites. He further emphasized that the majority of assets will be handed over to the government for civilian end use, supporting the priorities of the government. As you'll recall, there was an issue with the looting of a site not too long ago. During the visit, a uh, framework agreement on the issue was also signed between Mr. Kare and the uh, Sudanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He will be there until Sunday. Meanwhile, Mark Lokok traveled to the DRC, but only virtually. He made a virtual visit to Beni today, the town located in the eastern part of the country and home for a decades-long protection crisis. 
he spoke to internally displaced families as well as host communities. The people he spoke to said they wanted peace to return to their homes and to feel safe. Mr. Lokok visited uh, visit highlighted the resilience and generosity of the Congolese communities hosting displaced people. With 5.2 million men, women, and children displaced, the Democratic Republic of the Congo currently has the second largest number of internally displaced persons around the world. The country also hosts 527,000 refugees from neighboring countries. More information online. UNICEF, uh, just a couple of COVID notes before we go to your questions. UNICEF today says that at least one in seven children, that's 332 million children globally, has li have lived under required or recommended nationwide stay-at-home policies for at least nine months since the start of the pandemic. The agency warns that this is putting their mental health and well-being at risk. In response, UNICEF is supporting government and partner organization to prioritize and adapt services for children. Some good news on COVAX. Um, Lesotho and Sudan received vaccines through the COVAX facility yesterday. Our UN teams on the ground are supporting authorities to roll out the vaccination campaigns. More than 800,000 doses of vaccines arrived in Khartoum following the arrival of 4.5 metric tons of syringes and safety boxes that UNICEF also delivered on behalf of COVAX last week. Uh, this will support the initial vaccination of healthcare workers and people above the age of 45 with chronic medical conditions. Lesotho received an initial batch of 36,000 doses of the vaccine. The shipment traveled to, from India via the Middle East to South Africa by plane and then on to capital of Misuru by road. Healthcare workers are being trained and vaccinations will start in the coming days, first in the capital, then across the country with initial doses targeting all healthcare workers. A new report by UNDP says that a temporary basic income for hundreds of millions of women in developing countries could prevent rising poverty and widening gender inequalities during the pandemic. The report released ahead of International Women's Day shows that a monthly investment of 0.07% of developing countries' GDP could provide reliable financial security to 613 million women living in poverty. More information online. A um, interesting note on food waste from UNEP. An estimated 931 million tons of food, uh, metric tons that is, or 17% of all food available to consumers in 2019 went into the trash of households, retailers, restaurants, and other food services. That's according to a new report by UNEP. To give you an idea, that this amount roughly equals to 23 million fully loaded 40-ton trucks, bumper to bumper, enough to circle the earth seven times. The report shows that most of the waste comes from households, which discard about 11% of the total food available. Uh, UNEP says at a time when climate action is still lagging, 8 to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions are associated with food that is not consumed. Reducing food waste would cut greenhouse emissions, and um, more information is available online. Food price index for this month, according to FAO, food commodity prices rose for the ninth consecutive month in February, with quotations for sugar and vegetable oils increasing the most. In February, FAO food price index was 2.4 percent higher than the previous month, up to 26.5 percent from a year ago. That's a significant rise in food prices. Senior personnel appointment. Today, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, is announcing the appointment of Cherith Norman Shalit of the United States as Assistant Secretary General for General Assembly and Conference Management uh, in the Department of General Assembly and Conference Management. She will succeed um, Moses Abalian of Armenia, who holds the position of Under Secretary General for General Assembly and Conference Management. Mr. Shalit brings many years of experience in foreign policy and international issues and has considerable knowledge and involvement in UN and intergovernmental machinery. Uh, you will recall her most from her time as U.S. Ambassador and Representative to the General Assembly, as well as Security Council and Funds and Programs. More in her bio. Uh, tomorrow, we will be joined by Vincent Martin, the U.N. Resident Coordinator in Guinea. He will join us brief, excuse me, virtually to brief on the situation in Guinea, particularly uh, to the challenges due to COVID-19 and the resurgence of Ebola. I'm going to take a water break, if you don't mind.
Uh, now we will go to James. Okay, um, T. Gray, please. Um, uh -huh. uh, when this started, uh, the Ethiopian Prime Minister told the Secretary General it was going to be a quick operation. The military operation is still ongoing. It's four months today. Can you give us an update on the Secretary General's view of the situation, what diplomacy is underway, and as the Security Council meets on this issue, um, as we speak, what the, uh, the Secretary General wants the Security Council to do? Um, so, um, the Secretary General has had uh, a number of conversations with uh, Prime Minister Abiy in the last uh, few months. I mean, his, his message to him privately and publicly uh, are the same, which is to increase the humanitarian access, uh, stop the fighting, work on and work on issues of reconciliation. Um, we continue to be very concerned uh, by the overall situation. Uh, I think Mr. Lokok alluded to some improvement on humanitarian uh, access and the lessening of bureaucratic hurdles. Um, but I think that the headlines that we've seen about human rights violations, uh, mass killings, uh, sexual uh, violence is extremely uh, concerning, and the Secretary General fully supports uh, the statements made by the High Commissioner for, uh, for Human Rights. A quick follow-up, um, uh, and it's about that statement of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, because she talks about the role of um, Eritrean forces. She says those reports have been corroborated. Whenever we've asked you, you say the UN has no proof of whether Eritreans there. Now part of the UN is saying they are there. So, and, and they seem to be, in, in, in multiple reports, guilty of some of the worst abuses. Your reaction to, the, to, to, the, to, to what the Eritrean troops are doing in Tigray, and can you update us? You told us what contact uh, the Secretary General has had with the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. In this four months, and with these persistent allegations of Eritrean forces, can you tell us w whether he's spoken to to the president of Eritrea? Uh, I'm not aware that the Secretary General has spoken to the president of, uh, of Eritrea. Uh, we have uh, colleagues on the ground uh, who've had contacts with all the major uh, players. Um, you know, I think uh, the, the High Commissioner for, for Human Rights is acknowledging what has been in the, uh, in, in the public domain, uh, and I think she's been very clear in uh, listing uh, the groups and the entities who could be uh, guilty of crimes against humanity, of, uh, of, of more crimes. To, not, I'm, let me just rephrase, who, who could have uh, possibly committed uh, these, uh, these crimes? And the Secretary General, I think, fully backs her call for independent uh, investigations. You uh, say who could possibly commit it. It says in her that the office has managed to corroborate information. She's proved right. it. So, um, I mean, are you going to condemn what she has proved Eritrean troops are doing Listen, we in, condemn, in, we... in, in, in Tigray? And is it time for the Secretary General to pick up the phone to the President of Eritrea? Uh, the Secretary General uh, is working on all the possible diplomacy uh, that, that he can. Uh, I mean, I'm I was just paraphrasing what she was saying. We have, uh, we fully back uh, what she says and her, her position. Celia and then Edie will go down the, the line. Uh, Stefan, a woman called Emma Reilly, who works for the office of the United Nations Hush Commissioner for Human Rights and is a human rights lawyer, has repeatedly alleged that the Human Rights Office in Geneva shared the name of China's opponent with the government, the Chinese government. And she said that this is the only exception that the UN has made. Is that true? No, we don't uh, agree with uh, her description of our, of our policies. I think contrary to her claims, at no time has any activist been placed, placed at risk by the Human Rights Office practices of responding to inquiries from member states requesting for confirmation of the names of activists accredited to attend the Human Rights Council sessions. Since the start of the Human Rights Council in 2006, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights stopped providing lists of those accredited to attend. Instead, 
in response to specific inquiries from member states regarding names of individuals, the office confirmed the names of well-known people for whom confirmation of their names presented no additional risk, given they were already in the public domain. From 2015, given the limited nature of the practice, the office ceased providing confirmation to member states that individuals were accredited to attend sessions. Edie. Uh, thank you very much, Steph. Uh, perhaps you saw the video of the arrest of Associated Press journalist Thane Saw as he was photographing Myanmar security forces charging at anti-coup protesters. And the video shows him being quickly surrounded, held in a chokehold, and having handcuffs put on him. Um, authorities have charged Thane Saw and five other members of the media with violating a public order law that could see them imprisoned for three years. Uh, does the Secretary General have any comment on these arrests? I think the, the video is extremely disturbing to anyone who, who sees it. I mean, I've, I've seen it. Uh, the Secretary General and the, the UN family has repeatedly called uh, on every country to allow journalists to do their job uh, free of harassment, free of, rest, uh, of arrest, free of violence. I think we have seen in Myanmar in recent, uh, in recent days uh, harassment, arrests, and physical attacks on journalists. Those must cease. And those journalists who have detained, along with the others, other people who have been arrested, should also be freed. I have a follow-up on the letter that uh, you received and that you read out. And you said that the General Assembly Credentials Committee had circulated it to member states, I believe. Um, correct. What, what is the significance or is there any significance to the committee circulating that letter? I mean, it's basically we're keeping the committee, the credentials committee, informed of these changes and these letters as we, we come. I mean, I think it's it's only normal when you have a situation of uh, you know uncertainty, as one could describe it, uh, that these things shared be shared with uh, with the committee. Okay, uh, Evelyn. Thank you, Steph. Good seeing you in person. Nice to see you in person. Right. Um, a couple. Questions. You mentioned yesterday, I believe, or the day before, that the SG um, spoke to relevant governments about the atrocities in Myanmar. Is, did he speak to China, which has yet to condemn? Uh, yes, he's spoken. I mean, he's had, let me put it this way, he's spoken to, uh, I think, the issue of Myanmar has been raised uh, in one way or another with all the permanent members of the Security Council, with prominent uh, members of ASEAN, including the presidency, Brunei. Uh, Brunei. Uh, some of these calls were done at the foreign minister level. Some of these calls were done with the permanent representatives. Right. And a brief question. Uh, has a successor been named to Mr. Lowcock? I assume it will be a Brit, but... It will be announced when it is announced, when you see okay. white smoke. Um, okay, uh, we'll Thank go to you. Tobias, and then we'll go back to, come back to you, Carla. Toby. Thank you very much, Steph. Yesterday we heard uh, from Special Envoy Bergner uh, speaking about um, Myanmar, and she made the, the, the point that not all of the armed ethnic militias in the country, um, and, and maybe very few of them, had fallen in line uh, behind the, the Tatmadaw uh, in terms of the, um, their takeover of the government. How worried is the UN of a full-scale civil war? Uh, and it is, we're hearing mostly about protests now, but, but how, how concerned is the Secretary General about a civil war in the country? Thank you. Look, I, I think, you know, the, the, the coup is having many knock-on effects. Uh, we've talked about basic human rights. 
uh, basic the, the basic rights of people to live in a free and democratic uh, society. We've talked about the impact on the humanitarian uh, work that we do. We've talked about the impact of COVID, but it clearly will and, and is likely already having an impact on the efforts uh, that had been ongoing uh, to bring uh, of the various armed groups, armed ethnic groups, uh, into um, into a successful uh, peace process. So I think it, it, it would be it would be right to say that you know we're we're concerned that the events in Myanmar have derailed or delaying or or having a negative impact on basically all, all the, the all critical facets of life in uh, in Myanmar. Uh, Carla. Thank you, Steph. Um, you may have already mentioned this. It came to me as a very sad surprise. One of the three video workers uh, at the stakeout died. Damien, his name was. Um, do you know anything about that? And, and is the UN planning any kind of, um, what can I say, memorial to him? I, th I think we we mentioned this quite quite a while ago. Yeah. Uh, um, Abdel Hamid. Thank you, Stefan, and I apologize for not uh, putting the video. Uh, I have two questions. First, uh, Stefan, uh, as a follow up to my question yesterday, I ask uh, bluntly if the UN will apologize to Mr. Graham Boot. He has been falsely and politically targeted for misconduct, and he was found innocent. And he is asking for uh, a clear-cut apology from the UN, so that to clear his name, he would be uh, maybe available for future hosts in the UN. That's one thing. I, I, and my second question. Go yes, ahead. Please. No, go ahead. My second. My second question about the situation in the occupied Palestinian territories regarding the COVID-19. The authority declared one month emergency. The situation is going out of hand. The, situ uh, the uh, availability of vaccine is very dire. Yet Israel today are now selling vaccine to Denmark and another country in Northern Europe. I forgot the name of the second country. Is that fair uh, treatment of the people under occupation. We, we are working uh, with our Palestinian partners in effort to help uh, with the vaccine availability and distribution through COVAX and, and other means. Uh, we've also been in contact with the Israeli uh, authorities in the, in the manner of which I've already uh, highlighted a number of times. I think what is important is that there is global solidarity across the board uh, for, uh, for, the vac for access to the vaccine. Uh, on your first question, I think uh, Fahan uh, shared with you the, what we had to say, uh, and we put it into the record yesterday, and I have nothing uh, else to add on that. Okay, uh, James, and then we'll go to our guest who's been very patient. Um, yes. Sorry, I'm getting things to ask you as I speak. Um, <laughs> News coming Then in. I'll have to get things to answer you as, uh, as you speak. Uh, yes, well, um, let me start with this one. Um, uh, Afghanistan. Um, um, uh, Zalmay Khalilzad, the US envoy, has been visiting Kabul. Um, and there's some reports that he's suggesting now an international conference on Afghanistan that would be organized by the UN. Is the UN aware of these reports? Has it had early discussions yes, we, we, with the envoy about setting up some sort of conference? We, I, all I can tell you is that we are aware of these reports and have nothing to add at this point. Okay. Um, a quick check for you. Um, uh, I know you don't like talking about appointments and we have to wait for the white smoke, but um, Western Sahara, it's coming up to the two-year anniversary. What is the reason why, for two years, the Secretary General has been unable to find a personal envoy to do this job? Does no one want the job? Let me put it this way. It's not the easiest job on the UN roster. Uh, it's a critical job. The Secretary General has been trying uh, very hard to fill the, the position. Uh, but 
as in a lot of these appointments, uh, not all the levers are in his hands, but he is doing his bit. Uh, and the last, you <clears throat> probably are aware, because you've, you've quoted part of it, but Mr. Lowcock has just finished speaking, I'm told, in the council. Mm -hmm. And I'm told that among the things that he said was what we were talking about earlier, that Eritrean troops were present. He said it was abundantly clear to everyone that they were present and that they should now leave. Is that also the Secretary-General's view? Is he calling on Eritrean yes. troops to leave Tigray? Yes.